bienvenue donc euh, à la deuxième conférence plénière donc avec euh, notre donc, euh, conférencier invité Frédéric Stein. Euh, donc moi je suis déjà intensément à l'Université Lyon 1, je fais partie de la, la comité d'organisation locale et donc à partie du laboratoire SEHEP. Euh, donc euh, j'ai pas beaucoup d'annonces, euh, euh, mais, mais il faut que je souligne la, la, session, ou la séance plénière ce soir à 18h45 pour le SFHST, donc tout le monde est invité, euh, donc évidemment c'est mieux si vous avez payé vos cotisations, sinon vous êtes toujours donc, le bienvenu, pour ça le monde rappelé qu'il faut le faire. Euh, voilà, donc ça c'est à 18h45, euh, euh, donc autrement il y avait quelques changements de salle, mais donc euh, vous pouvez vous renseigner donc, à l'accueil ou sur la fiche euh, en face, donc il y avait donc une inversion de salle pour aujourd'hui et pour demain. Euh, D'accord, donc euh, vous pouvez venir, je vous présente. Euh, oui. Donc, euh, donc la deuxième conférence invitée, donc le conférencier, c'est euh, avec beaucoup de plaisir qu'on qu euh, qu reçoit donc Friedrich Steinle ici. Friedrich Steinle qui, qui est professeur en histoire des sciences à l'université technique de Berlin. Euh, donc il a eu donc une carrière international. Euh, donc il a passé, j'ai noté quelques villes, donc euh, Paris, Cambridge, euh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, et donc et Berne et Wuppertal. Donc, euh, et puis donc, maintenant il enseigne et il était il est professeur donc, aussi à Lyon pendant une année, donc euh, ici à Lyon. Donc euh, Frédéric, à partir des études sur Newton, il s'est spécialisé en histoire et la philosophie de l'expérience scientifique qui va être le sujet de sa communication aujourd'hui. Euh, donc, histoire et philosophie de l'expérimentation. Donc, moi, j'ai toujours, je ne sais jamais s'il faut parler d'expérience scientifique ou expérimentation euh, en français. Donc, c'est plus facile en anglais. Euh, donc, euh, des nouvelles perspectives. Donc, moi, je suis chargé du truc euh, bilingue. Donc, maintenant, je vais passer en anglais parce que la présentation va être en anglais. Euh, donc, je vais faire une toute petite présentation en anglais. So um, the the second uh, the second conference with invited speakers, Friedrich Steiner, who's at the um, yeah, Technical University. In J'ai compris Berlin. tout ça. De okay. <laughs> and he'll talk about the history and philosophy of experiment, recent research, and new perspectives. Okay. Merci. Bonjour. Um, merci pour l'invitation et merci pour uh, um, cette. Okay. C'est l'introduction. C'est un grand honneur pour moi euh, d'avoir la possibilité de, de partager les résultats de mon recherche avec vous. Et je remercie beaucoup les organisateurs de ces congrès pour cette invitation. Je suis vraiment heureux aussi de partager un congrès des sociétés françaises d'histoire des sciences et techniques euh, parce que euh, dans, une année, dans des années là, euh, dans ces années-là, je suis président de, de Pendant, de cette société de Pendant allemand, et je connais bien l'importance des, euh, des congrès comme ça pour notre échange intellectuel et pour notre vie comme discipline. Comme Jonathan a dit, l'Université Lyon 1 et l'équipe S2AGP en particulier a une importance particulière pour moi personnellement, euh, car il y a dix ans environ maintenant, j'ai eu la possibilité d'enseigner ici et c'est une pour moi personnellement c'était une période très intense, très importante et très amicalement. Voilà, c'est très bien d'être ici encore une fois. C'est dommage que je, fais, que je dois faire un annoncement un peu, un, peu, un peu triste. Mon niveau des Français, comme vous, comme vous voyez, euh, n'était pas très haut jamais. Et pendant les, 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 les dernières années, ce n'est pas amélioré. Donc, euh, je ne suis pas dans une bonne position de donner mon intervention, mon intervention dans votre langage. Euh, je vais, je vais euh, faire donner mon présentation dans notre, notre nouvelle lingua franca, l'anglais, et je m'excuse pour ça. Euh, 
Mais je peux vous assurer, c'est mieux pour vous comme pour moi. <laughs> okay, I switch to English now. <clears throat> My topic, as you see, is history and philosophy of experiment. As uh, Jonathan has, has uh, already mentioned, I had worked a little bit for the last uh, 10 years or so on those topics and I'm happy to share with you uh, my, my, the state of my research. It's not a, not a rounded up talk that I will give but more an open talk that addresses open questions. <coughs> my talk will have mainly two major parts divided in two each again. The first part is a more general view on the hist history of experiment and on the history of the reflection on experiment. And the second part is more focused on a specific type of experimentation. Uh, again, I will present it briefly and then uh, mention some challenges I see here for future research. <coughs> history of experiment is often and even nowadays still presented in popular books uh, in, a, in a very rough way that could be summarized Western science had a scientific revolution in the early modern period, uh, sometimes called the origin of modern science in some textbooks, and the main characteristics of, of that revolution were mathematization of the sciences on the one hand and experimentation. Science na or natural philosophy became experimental. Some authors go even so far and even up to this day you find these statements that saying that the experimental method or experimental approach has been invented in the 17th century. They follow in that much the rhetorics of some protagonists, some 17th century protagonists they, who, who highlight exactly that point. <laughs> but as we know now, and this is a, 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 a result of research in the last decades, one must say, <coughs> This historical picture is crudely false and it has to be qualified, it has to be revised. We, we know for sure now that the, the, the type of research we call experimental research reaches far back into the, in the medieval period, both Latin and Arabic, and even into the antiquity. <coughs> Think of the older researches of Alistair Crombie, newer researches of William Newman, <coughs> or uh, again uh, for the, both for Middle Ages and uh, for of the researches of Jeffrey Lloyd for antiquity or rather unknown but very pointed Matthias Schramm for experiment in antiquity. So we know there was experimental approaches for uh, since long. <coughs> Of course, this poses us in a different position, and uh, I will just show you. Uh, okay, uh, I will just show you some challenges that come out then, and that we are not have we are not in a position to have good answers to them. <laughs> so one one is the big questions: What is then the new thing that happened in the 17th century? It's certainly not the invention of experiment of experimental approaches. But something, there is something, and all authors agree, and I would agree to that, that in the early 17th, or in the, during the 17th century, with people like Galileo, Descartes, uh, and others, there is something happening. But what is it uh, concerning experiment? But what exactly is it? We have not a good answer for that, in my view. Perhaps you, uh, you know better, you know more. I'm happy to hear about that. One approach, one um, line to go forward here is to look at experimental approaches in fields that are rather practic practical domains or have been regarded as practical domains. So it's not per chance that, for example, alchemy, which always has a practical dimension, uh, is exactly one, one field that shows us that experimentation reaches far back. <coughs> But what about metallurgy, mechanics, medicine, uh, hydraulics too? Uh, so looking at experimentation, experimentation in these practical, or practical or, uh, pr fields that are oriented towards practice, this will help us to understand better what happened in the 17th century. 
one big issue we haven't we have really no good idea so far is what about experimentation in non-European science traditions what about China India <laughs> um, there we know much more you had the, the talk of Karin Chemla yesterday um, but uh, and I admire the work that was done has, has been done but for experimentation in particular we don't have many studies so I think for the history of experiment these are some of the major challenges for future research let me mention one thing uh, there is one methodological challenge or historiographical challenge how to do such research <coughs> uh, there are difficulties of course there is not actually not much talk of experiment before the 17th century there are even uh, nowadays some languages uh, that do not have words for experiment even if I gave this talk in French I always have the difficulties experience it's much broader than experiment um, but what does that mean I don't think so much I think in French it's it's very clear uh, these days but what do we do with uh, languages where we don't find the term experiment <coughs> And if we find it, uh, look to medieval texts, we often find that if they talk of experiment, the word experiment has a very different meaning from what we think of experiment. So researching the history of experiment poses this such historiographical challenges. And just, give him, uh, just to give you my, my clue or the, my, my approach how to do, how to deal with it, uh, there are big historiographical questions behind of how to deal with anachronisms of course if we use experiment to describe a procedure in Aristotle and actually we, we would find such a thing we, we commit an, anachron an anachronism uh, but once we do it uh, I think reflect it uh, it's, it's, it's well justified and it's necessary in some way but this, this keeps us, of course, in the necessity to define what do we mean by experiment? What procedures do we identify as ex experimental procedures? And there, uh, in the, in the um, research community or in, in the research landscape, one agreement has come up uh, to understand an experimental procedure as a procedure that intervenes, that interacts with, with the things to be investigated actively and that has the goal to create knowledge this is, makes the difference to cooking for example sometimes you cook also you, you experiment in cooking if you want to know about but usually you want to produce a good food a good meal but uh, in experimentation is deliberate to produce knowledge with that rough notion behind you can do very much and you can meet some of these uh, what we, we can go forward to work on these challenges this was my first part. This was a very brief part of how I see the, our, the state of the art in that, um, to, uh, to that question. My second point related to that would be the uh, brief considerations about the history of reflections upon experiment. I wrote here of the philosophy of experiment. This is a big word. Perhaps one should talk a little bit more modestly of the history of uh, reflections of experiment. And there we have this striking, so again I will give you a very short uh, uh, some points and uh, tell you where I see the challenges. <clears throat> this history in some way really begins in the 17th century. Even those experimenters whom we identify for earlier periods we can identify experimental approaches but we cannot find reflections about what they do when they when they do uh, follow this approach <coughs> so uh, the, but in the 17th century actually starting with the 17th century with people like Gilbert or Descartes uh, and uh, of course Francis Bacon uh, we find explicit long reflections on experiment <coughs> I will give you a very rough uh, line starting with Francis Bacon uh, and Bacon was of course one of the most outspoken protagonists of experiment once you once we look at Bacon uh, 
what exactly, what pro experimental procedures does he propose to learn something? He has basically two. One is experiment as a means of filling the tables that he wants to use for his further inductions. So just to, to collect empirical findings. Bacon doesn't make a huge difference between experiment and observation for that. This is one use of experiments, collect empirical findings. But Bacon has also, as all of you know, another use of experiment. Bacon speaks of, uh, introduces the notion of instantiae crucis, of observations and usually experiments that, uh, that enable us to decide between competing um, theories, we would perhaps say, in a modern, modernized language. You have two theories that uh, might to, to, uh, explain one and the same experiment or empirical finding, and you, you think of an experiment that's able to decide between these two. This is a very different use of experiment. These are experiments deliberately constructed to answer demands of the theory. In Bacon, we have these two. Uh, I, I run, I rush over the 17th century, we'll come back in a uh, later part, um, I rush through the 18th century. Uh, I, one point where we find an experimental method very clearly spelled out is in the 19th century, <coughs> and really spelled out as a method of doing and reasoning. John Stuart Mill in 1843 gave a um, and a, a quite sophisticated account of how to arrange experiment and what exactly to learn from experiments. He framed this account uh, in the in, in uh, was what what we call setting up difference methods. So uh, have an experimental arrangement and change one parameter only one by one and look what the outcome is and how the outcome changes. And then Mill says we can conclude, we can infer from those experiments to what he calls causal relations between the, the experimental parameters and the effect they produce. Um, this is a quite inductivistic, uh, and Mill, him, Mill himself regards, him, uh, regards himself as, uh, as someone who fulfills the big promise made by Bacon, uh, but never spelled out by Bacon, how can we learn by experiments in an inductive way. <coughs> so perhaps this is the, the heyday, the most elaborate inductivist uh, um, methodology of experiments. At the turn of the, at the end of the 19th century, we find a total switch in, in the reflection of experiment. One main figure is Pierre Duhem, who in his 1906 um, aim and structure of physical theories gave a very, very different account of what the use of experiments is. As you all know, Duhem, uh, he starts actually with an analysis of the historical, of the claims done by historical actors. He takes Newton on the one hand, he takes Ampère on the other hand. Both of them claim they do experiments in inductive ways. Duhem reads what they actually do and realizes what they actually do has nothing to do with inductivism. They use experiment in a very different way. And Duhem starts from, from this historical finding, he starts his reasoning and comes up with a very bold claim saying there is no inductive reasoning with experimenting. Just there is no, it's impossible. What we can do with experiments is quite the other thing. We develop our theories by whatever means, even by dreaming or drinking alcohol or whatever. We develop some theories, of course, not only by those means. And then, only then, once we have a theory, we put it on test and then we confront it with experiment. And this is the role of experiment to be confronted with uh, claims derived from theory. He, he, he's very um, sophisticated in elaborating uh, how exactly such tests can be done, not one by one, but only groups of theories with groups of experiments. So he's against uh, Bacon's uh, experimentum crucis. But in general, the main line is 
experimenting are nothing but testing instances. Afterwards, testing after you have, have developed sort of theory. This position was very much refined from a philosophical point of view by um, some philosophers, mainly, for example, Karl Popper in the, in the 1930s. Um, Popper says at some point, um, experiment is nothing but the handmaiden of theory. Experiment deals with questions put by theory, or experimenters deal with questions put by theorists and only with those questions, nothing else. Uh, Popper gives a, a philosophical reasoning behind, uh, much based on what, we, what later was called then the theory ladiness of all observation and experiment. <laughs> this position became, through the, throughout the 20th century, sort of the standard view of philosophers of science. This is, has to be qualified a little bit because in, indeed throughout the 20th century in philosophy of science I don't find much interest in experiments at all. Uh, even in the, in, uh, I had looked at the French traditions, uh, Epistemologie des Sciences, on it, uh, one doesn't find much reasoning on experiment proper and specifically. So mostly we could say philosophy of science during the 20th century was uninterested in experiment, but if it was interested, it quickly took Popper's position, experiment is there for testing, uh, some, or testing or refining, answering questions put by theorists. This is not only testing. <laughs> Only in the end of the 20th century, uh, to, uh, from the 1980s on, the scenery changed profoundly. <clears throat> um, there was obviously, and we don't understand, at least I don't understand exactly the reason why this unhappiness came up in the 1980s. There was an unhappiness with this neglect and uh, standard view on experiments. And uh, from the 1980s on, we have a new attention to experiment uh, both from historical, philosophical and sociological views, uh, approaches often closely intertwined. Sometimes this uh, this was an, uh, these activities, and they were not coordinated activities, but they came up from different directions, are labeled the new experimentalism. <coughs> I will show you uh, and not for reading, but just for illustration, a long list. This is just some highlights, some, some, some books that have come out and have been much discussed in that movement. <coughs> I don't want 